Well, hello, everybody, and it's just great to be with you, albeit through a, a screen at the Vineyard National Leaders Conference. Uh, Sammy and I have such deep affection and admiration for the Vineyard movement. Your impact on the church in the UK has been incalculable, and we're especially uh, grateful to John and Debbie Wright uh, for their courageous and clear leadership through this uh, really difficult year that we, we, we've all had. Um, thank you as leaders for the price that you've paid to lead sacrificially through, let's be honest, probably the most challenging year of any of our lives. I feel like it's, in my own life, been constant change management, dealing with a lot of grief and, and trauma. Uh, people are just angrier <laughs> than, 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 than before, and it's just been exhausting. And so just good job, well done, and thanks for having me with you like this now. John's asked me to share a message that I'm really carrying on my heart right now for the church uh, in the UK entitled A Time to Climb, A Time to Climb. And my prayer is that this can be a sort of re-centering uh, moment for all of us at a moment of such cultural and spiritual uh, dislocation. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I ask you that you would speak by your spirit deep into people's hearts and souls and psyches now. I pray, Lord, that you would bring encouragement and clarity, fresh strength, energy, and vision in the name of, for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to look together at a familiar passage. Uh, this is one that you all know well. This is 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to read verses 41 to 46. 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. Remember, he's, he's just had his big showdown uh, on Carmel with the prophets of Baal, and uh, there's been drought in the land. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud, as small as a man's hand, is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rainstorm came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Beautiful, powerful story. Israel is in deep crisis. Environmentally, it hasn't rained for three years. Economically, they're in crisis. They're an agrarian culture, which means that uh, their business world is in free fall. Businesses are going bust. Spiritually, they are in uh, crisis because the very foundations of Jewish identity are under attack. And then socially, they are in crisis because many have died and are dying. Everyone is mourning someone. Perhaps that all sounds strangely familiar. Are we in an environmental crisis? Well, you'd better believe it. Climate change, extinction of species, wildfires, acidification of the oceans. Economic crisis. The World Bank estimates that we're in the deepest recession in 150 years. Spiritual crisis. I could cite so many examples, but for example, four in 10 US millennials call themselves religiously disaffiliated. Social crisis, well, look at the Black Lives Matter movement, look at riots in the street, look at this pandemic, 1.2 million deaths so far, countless quiet tragedies affecting us all, school kids, with their whole lives up in the air, missing their friends, facing such uncertainty. Students 
isolated in halls of residence or unable to even attend university, families who've cancelled family uh, holidays, couples who've had a wrecking ball just swing through their wedding plans. The guy who finished furlough went back to work and was let go. The man who put everything into building a business that just went bust. The wife who couldn't say goodbye to her husband. This then is the backdrop to our lives. This is a similar backdrop to this story. And Elijah says, into this context of such despair, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. There's been three years of drought. There has been incalculable suffering. There's been a series of disasters in the land. And yet he senses the season's changing. He hears the storm clouds gathering. And we read that in response to this moment, Elijah climbs to the top of Carmel where he prays. The day before I got engaged to Sammy, I went climbing. Uh, We were on the Isle of Skye, and some of you will know the Kulin mountain range, some of the most challenging climbing in the UK because The Coolins are made of magnetic rock, and of course the weather is very unpredictable. And uh, we we, we were aiming to climb uh, one of the mountains in in that range called Skirn and Gillian. And we we set out, uh, Sammy wasn't wasn't with me, but uh, I was with two other guys. We set out to climb, and as we climbed, the weather came in. And, um, you know, it got pretty, you know, serious. We were rock climbing up kind of chimneys in the rock. I remember uh, losing visibility because the cloud had come right down. And eventually we ended up on a sort of knife edge. Um, and, and it's pretty scary at the best of times, but at the worst of times, which is when you've got zero visibility, it's terrifying. But eventually we managed to get right on top of Skern and Gillian, and we'd expect to have this amazing view, but of course we didn't see a thing. And then we had to get down. And that might sound simple, but it isn't simple if you don't have a GPS, because it's before sat-nav, if you can't use a compass because it's magnetic rock, And if you have zero visibility, all you can do is follow the path you see right at your footsteps because you can't see further afield. So we started to follow what we thought was the path. And that path began to take us down a very, very sheer face, really a cliff face. It was like a fault line in the cliff that was zigzagging down. And uh, we couldn't be sure but we were pretty sure that if we slipped off to one side, we wouldn't survive. And yet there was this strong, uh, almost survival instinct of we've got to get down under the cloud level so we can see. We were terrified and desperate. We'd been traveling down for about half an hour uh, when we reached a point where the the, the cliff petered out, the, 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 the path petered out, And the next bit of path we could just make out was probably about 10 foot, 8, 10 foot below us. Uh, And it was narrow. It was maybe, I don't know, two, three foot wide. And we were just about to try and jump down onto this next path. And again, I don't know what would have happened if we'd stumbled. And it occurred to me, if we go down, we can't get back up again. And I said, guys, we need to pray. We prayed and suddenly I knew with absolute clarity what we needed to do. And it was the opposite of what we wanted to do. I said to the guys, we need to go back up again. Every instinct is get down, regain visibility. It was getting late. The just natural light was also starting to fail. The night was coming in. Nothing in you wants to retrace your steps half an hour upwards to the top of a dangerous mountain when night is falling. But we did it, and I realized now it was the Lord was giving us wisdom. And when we got back to the top, we found another path, another route down. It eventually brought us down, and uh, we, we, we crossed to the Sligan Hotel at the bottom there, where Sammy was waiting for us, terrified. She had been advised, because it was long after nightfall when we finally got down, she was advised, you're going to have to wait till the morning for us to call out Mountain Rescue. 
And, and, and uh, you know, I, I decided not to get... I, originally, I was going to propose to Sammy that night. I decided maybe I should wait till the next day. But I woke up the next morning thinking, gosh, what was that? And then a couple of days later, I received the shocking news that my godfather, Michael Curry, wonderful man who prayed for me every day of my life until the day he died, had just died, climbing the same mountain range where he had tripped on a, a, a waterfall and fallen. And suddenly you realize, oh, we really could have died. Sometimes life is very like that expedition. You feel completely disorientated you can't find your bearings. The compass seems to be spinning and your path is perilous. Your vision has gone and the darkness is falling fast. And at those times, the Spirit of the Lord says to us, it's time to climb to higher ground. When there's no hope in the valley, it's time to climb. Elijah is facing social, spiritual, financial, and ecological disaster. He knew it was time to climb Carmel. He was recalling that God had said the rains would come, but he knew that bit somehow wasn't automatic. It was time to climb. He needed to pray it in. And notice the posture of prayer that he adopts on Carmel. He gets down, we're told, with, with his head between his knees. It's the fetal position. It's fascinating to me. I've read every commentary you can imagine on this uh, because uh, a lot of them say, well, this isn't the way people used to pray. He wasn't kneeling down. That's not how they prayed back then. Some are saying he was, he was trying to uh, hide his face so he couldn't see the sky. Maybe he was. Some are saying he was prostrating himself before the Lord. But what uh, no one seems to have noticed is he was in the fetal position. Read the story and emulate it. You'll be in the fetal position. The fetal position is the position that we adopt when we are in extreme trauma. And Elijah, we have every reason to believe, was going through extreme trauma. He's just fought for his life. He has just had 450 people executed. You, you don't just skip away from that. The next chapter, we read another encounter of him climbing another mountain, and he, said, he prays that he might die. This is a man going through deep post-traumatic stress, perhaps. So he is praying out of a place of faith, sure, the rains are coming, but it is a faith that is fused with fear. He is hopeful, yet he is hurting. He is travailing. He is exhausted. He is desperate. Perhaps these paradoxes sound familiar to you as we embark upon 2021. Maybe you're exhausted. Maybe you're dealing with trauma. Maybe you're facing acute misunderstandings. Maybe you're looking down the barrel of a terrifying medical prognosis. Maybe you're struggling to get free in a particular area of your life. Maybe you're wondering what God wants for your life because everything seems to be changing. At times like this, when we're disorientated, it is time to climb. It's time to find a higher perspective. I found this unbelievably cute video I want to show you, which depicts this metaphor of climbing more powerfully than anything else I can imagine. So take a look at this.
The Bear Cub did it. He made it to the top. Fantastic. <laughs> I thought my heart was in my mouth. The number of times he slipped back down to the bottom and he kept going. He's exhausted. But one thing kept that, that bear cub climbing. He was focused on his mother. He had no option but to get to the top, even when it seemed impossible. Sometimes climbing the hill of the Lord is just, we think it's beyond us. We're exhausted. We're we're disappointed. We're, We're questioning. We don't know if we can do it any longer. Our strength is all gone. At those times, Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 reminds us, fix your eyes on Jesus. Focus on the Father and notice the way that he endured so much for the joy that was set before him and that will help you not to become weary. You know, as it says in Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Our people have experienced deferred hope, disappointment again and again. There is heart sickness in the land. We must call them to climb the hill of the Lord. We must call them to focus on Jesus. The hope in Jesus is the source of strength. That's Isaiah 40. Hope in Jesus is the thing that will never let us down. If you put your hope in Jesus, you will never become hopeless. Your disappointments will not endure forever. Your longings will be recontextualized in something real. The call of the Lord is to climb. And of course, this is the story of the whole Bible. When God wanted to give Moses the law, it was time to climb Sinai. When he wanted to whisper in Elijah's ear, it was time to climb another mountain, Mount Horeb. When David wanted to build Jerusalem, he knew it was time to climb Mount Olivet. When Jesus wanted to give the Beatitudes, it was time for the Sermon on the Mount. When he climbed with Peter, James and John, it was the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem, that was the Mount of Olives. When he carried his cross, that was the Mount of Crucifixion. When he gave the Great Commission, that was a mountain overlooking Galilee. And most of all, I haven't even mentioned it yet, whenever Jesus wanted to pray, whether it was early in the morning or late at night, even right through the night on occasions, he climbed mountains to pray. And so when Elijah here senses the seasons changing, he knows it's time to climb. It's time to pray. It's time to focus on the Father. Amid so much tragedy, I believe that if you listen carefully, you will hear the sound of a heavy rain in our nation. I've been studying revivals for 25 years. And I've noticed that they almost always come to a culture that has been brought to its knees by crisis and suffering. In fact, I haven't found a single instance of a revival that came to a comfortable or complacent culture. It was sad that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs uh, died back in November. He was one of the great public theologians and statesmen of our time. And he said this, We have been coasting along for more than half a century in unprecedented affluence, unprecedented freedom, unprecedented optimism, and all of a sudden we are facing the fragility and the vulnerability of the human situation. This is the nearest we have been, he says, to a revelation for atheists. A revelation for atheists. Maybe that's why this pandemic has triggered such an explosion of prayer in the nation. There was a headline in the Guardian newspaper back in May. Maybe you saw it. I had to pinch myself. It said, British public turned to prayer after two decades seeking to mobilize and resource 24-7 prayer in our nation. That was an encouraging moment. But the subtitle was equally amazing. It continued Young people lead resurgence in faith. They estimate that about 3 million people turn to prayer in the UK through coronavirus. Certainly 24-7, we have never 
been busier. Uh, prayer rooms grew by 150% last year. We launched a little devotional called Lectio 365 just a year ago. That's gone from zero to 145,000 phones with 85,000 regular users. One nurse right on the front lines of, of caring for people with COVID said, my one moment in the day of peace is when I pause with a cup of tea to listen to Lecture 365. There was a YouGov poll last month uh, published in The Times. You may have seen it. It said that teenagers turn to God in pandemic. Isn't that wonderful? Please note, if you read the whole article, it's not all good news. Uh, we are seeing a, 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 unusually a spiritual decline in older age groups. And there has, uh, the YouGov poll says, been a slight rise in atheism over the last year uh, after several years of decline amongst atheists. But this does challenge, doesn't it, the narrative that successive generations must inevitably become more secular when teenagers are turning to God in this crisis. It's fuel for us in faith. It's the sound of a heavy rain. It's the invitation to get our head between our knees and pull in the heavy rain. I um, heard Rick Warren, who leads Saddleback Church, one of the most influential churches in the world. Uh, they, they've not been publicly meeting. They, they have more people in small groups than they do centrally. It's interesting, isn't it? Everyone's going to house church model now. Uh, even, even the um, uh, Episcopal traditions that used to criticize churches like ours and churches like vineyard churches for meeting in homes are suddenly going, oh, no, no, that's the way to do it. Uh, well, Saddleback uh, is meeting in, in homes. There's thousands of people. Rick Warren said 17,000 people have come to Christ since COVID broke out through their church. And he said 12,000 of those have been through one-on-one -on -one conversations, a lot of it through their social transformation work and conversations, this is important, about Jesus in the context of caring for people's felt needs. The Indian author Arundhati Roy says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different, she says. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. Well, if this is indeed such a generationally significant moment, if it is, as she says, a portal between one world and the next, if the seasons really are changing in the way that Elijah experienced, it is, of course, essential that we pray. Now, as well as climbing the mountain and putting our head between our knees and travailing in prayer, we must also engage. No one is supposed to spend their whole life on a mountain top. Uh, you know, 24-7 we're about prayer, but also mission and justice. We have to outwork our prayers. Uh, we have to come down the mountain sometimes. There's a time to climb, but there's also a time to run ahead of the king's chariot into the city. There's a time to lift our hands in prayer and there's a time to get them dirty in the ditch. There's a time to speak to God about the world and there's a time to speak to the world about God. That's really important. That was one of Rick Warren's things. He said what we realized is we were doing our evangelism over here, our worship over here, and our social transformation over there, and we'd stop really talking so much about Jesus in the context of social transformation. One of the keys to thousands of salvations they've seen is simply in feeding people and clothing people and caring for people, telling them, this is because of Jesus. It's one of the things I love about Vineyard's Compassion Ministries is this fusion of uh, the works and wonders of the kingdom with, uh, with the, the words and wonders, sorry, with the works of the kingdom. It's been a boom year, hasn't it, for Compassion Ministries? And I, I, I'm, I'm just cheering you guys on in all that you're doing from Love Christmas to boxes of hope. I see that 1,500 school children were given uniforms in Plymouth. 
I hear about market gardening schemes in Bath, fostering and adoption uh, with, with uh, Chuck and the guys up in Aberdeen. 5,000 people clothed and fed and helped in Coleraine, and so on. We have work to do, shaping systems and uh, creating cultures in our cities. And so we climb the mountain and we pray, and then we enter the city in front of the king's chariot. We fight injustice. We receive perspective and power to deliver these services on the mountain. But then we turn from prayer to obedience. The final thing I want to say to you is this. Notice the role of revelation in Elijah's breakthrough. He hears the word of the Lord. He prayed the way that he prayed and engaged the way that he engaged because God had spoken to him. Just read verse 1 of the chapter. I believe God is wanting to speak to us powerfully as uh, you guys gather together, home to home, uh, in whatever context you are doing this over these days. I believe God wants to remind us and to galvanize us once again with his word and with his words spoken over our lives, over our churches. Get some of those old prophecies out over our cities at the start of this new year. Sadly, in 2020, we saw the prophetic abused terribly in certain contexts. Those prophets who got it wrong need to just apologize and own up to it. If you, you shared a directional prophecy in a, a local context, that, then, then, then just deal with it there. But if you shared something online that was global, then you need to face up to it lest the prophetic be brought into disrepute. And it's because I'm committed to the prophetic, which is, of course, one of the hallmarks of the vineyard movement, that we must, at this time, uh, lean into uh, helpful prophetic etiquette. And we must not back off the prophetic just because some people have got it wrong. It's fine. The Apostle Paul says we prophesy in part, but let's just have a little humility when we don't get it right. By the way, this isn't aimed at anyone in vineyard, but I'm sure you have uh, uh, some understanding of what I'm saying. So let me finish by just sharing one or two prophetic words that are true and right and have proven proper. And uh, I think they'll be helpful to you. In October 2019, so what is that, like 15 months ago, uh, the 24-7 tribes gathered in Belfast, Northern Ireland for our 20th anniversary event. And a proven prophet by the name of Chris Westhoff said, I see a great leveling coming in the coming year. There's going to be a great leveling. We didn't know what that meant, of course. And then, and I want to be honest with you, I got this wrong as a leader. Uh, a man called Bob Eckblad, that's a dear friend of ours, very caught up with 24-7, a social justice uh, a leader, a theologian. Bob Eckblad had a dream, which he came and shared with me, and it wasn't until it started to come true, I realized, oh my goodness, that was God speaking. I should have done more. But in his dream, he saw a black man being lynched whilst white people sang Sunday school songs. And then after the black man had been lynched, everything was made tidy again as if nothing had happened. Deeply disturbing, deeply distressing dream. And now I realize God was speaking to us. This is four months before Ahmad Arbery uh, was killed in Georgia. This was five months before Breonna Taylor was killed in Kentucky. It was seven months before George Floyd was killed in Minnesota. God was warning us, speaking to us, get ready, get ready. For, uh, the Holy Spirit is doing something in the realm of justice. He's leveling the playing field. He's raising up those who've been oppressed for the color of their skin, for their ethnicity. He's pulling down those who've been arrogant racially, economically, and in other ways. Whenever God speaks to us, it's time to pray. It's time to climb. So yeah, these are serious times in which we live. We live in a strange land. 
The land is in crisis, socially, economically, uh, racially, spiritually, in every other way. But, brothers and sisters, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. Perhaps, like me up that mountain, you've lost visibility. You're feeling disorientated at the start of the year. The path seems to have run out. The clouds have come down. You feel scared. You've been relentlessly reacting. And the Lord is saying to you at the start of this year, take a deep breath. Listen to me. It's time to climb. Seek my presence. Perhaps like that little bear cub. You you don't even know if you've got the strength left. Focus on the Father. Keep going. It's time to climb. This conference, I believe, marks a moment for Vineyard when God is calling you to retrace your steps to the essence of the vineyard movement, which is encounter with God, the presence paradigm. It's time to return to the places where he last spoke to you and to pick up some of those old words again and contest for them and pray them in. It's time to reprioritize prayer as never before. It's time to seek God's face together. It's time to activate God's promises over our lives, our cities, and over this nation. My friends, it's time, perhaps as never before in any of our lifetimes, it is time to ascend the head of the Lord. It's time to climb. God bless you.